Hi folks, how's it going? This is episode nine of the football pod and you're all very welcome along. Paddy Andrews, you're after spotting something in the corner. How's it going? Good, good, good. Have we got to go? No, it leaves us at the post. So a bit of scheduling conflict here. We're trying to fit into Andy Moran's busy schedule. So Jesus, we have to put it out on the Euros. Hey, Tommy, Tommy, you have to back me up here. That makes a change, though. He's the star. He's the celeb here. (laughs) That's the first one in nine, I have to say. A bit of of chopping and changing, lads, uh, as we've we've gone along over the last couple of weeks. We're recording tonight, Tuesday night. Um, The commitment to the cause is that Andy Moran's doing it from his holidays in Ennis Grown. Fair play to you, Andy. Like I live about twenty minutes away from the school, so no. but it's uh, yeah, we're 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 down here with the two kids, so yeah, we're 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 ready to rock. Listen, yeah, uh, a staycation in Ireland over the last two weeks hasn't hasn't been the greatest thing in the world with the rain and the sun, but. If anyone's planning to go on holidays next week, Paddy Andrews is going and the sun follows Paddy Andrews wherever it goes. <laughs> Chase the sun. Chase the sun. Down, down in the kingdom. Looking forward to it. So you're listening to episode nine of the football pod. Uh, we have a lot to talk about today. Um, a number of counties got knocked out. That's their summer over. A couple of inter-county managers left. Um, Porrick Davis is gone. Mike Quirk has gone from leash. Um, there's a couple of massive matches to talk about this weekend. There's two Ulster quarterfinals. There's a Connacht semi-final. There's two Munster semi-finals. But there's one place we have to start, and that's Mead 422. Lo- I'm only joking. <laughs> Stephen Cluxon. Paddy, has anything changed in the last 24 hours since you were on with Joe on Off the Ball? Um, you were saying on Monday nights Off the Ball that you don't expect Stephen to, to play for Dublin again this championship. Anything to change your mind since then? No, I don't know. By Stephen's nature, if you're waiting for him to come out and talk to the media, you're going to be waiting a very long time. Um, that's just his style. Um, no, look, look. as I was saying last night, uh, um, what's gone on, the championship's been on for two weeks and there hasn't really been a story so far. We've had the one-sided games, there's been no upsets. The Hurland had a great weekend and that was, that was a big kind of kickoff for their championship where the football championship is waiting to ignite. So when you arrive to Wexford Park on, on Sunday afternoon and the captain of the, the reigning all Ireland champions and, and, and arguably the most iconic player of the past certainly decade for, for Dublin is MIA, that is going to be a story. And I think Desi, to be fair to him, there wasn't a whole point else he could have said. You know, if, if a player has stepped away and for whatever reason, you know, mentally or physically, just not, not at the pitch of it right now, you know, that is... By the nature of it, it it's going to create headlines, particularly because it's Dublin, and like I say, particularly because there's not a whole pile else going on at the minute. For the Dublin players, they've been down this road before, and, and even my own experience, I remember in, in 2016, we had our all-star fullback, Rory O'Carroll, and the reigning footballer of the year, Jack McCaffrey, both left the panel. Um, Rory was heading away, doing a bit of work, and, and Jack was doing some charity work. We obviously had Dermot Connolly step away a couple of times, and again, these are kind of high, high profile things, but from the players' point of views at that time, I remember all those conversations we had when the guys announced that they weren't going to be around. I would have sat down with Jim Gavin. And I was like, yeah, Rory's not here, Jack's not going to be here, or Dermot's not going to be here, or Paul Mannion as well. I've had a couple of years. And the players just kind of, it's quite ruthless in a way. You just move on straight away. Like the players are not sitting there kind of twiddling their thumbs, waiting a training for, for Stephen to show up. They'll kind of just kick on. And the nature of this championship as well, they don't have time to be worrying or focusing on that. It was a pretty sloppy performance from Dublin against Wexford. They'll be reviewing that this week. And then they're playing Mead in nine days' time. So so from the players' point of view, they'll move on pretty quickly. And it's Evan Comerford's got the opportunity now, who's an outstanding young goalkeeper in his own right. But because of the nature of of the player involved, that it's Stephen Crooks and he's been there for 20 years, I think Desi's probably going to get more questions about it. The story is probably not going to go away, but from the players, they're going kind to of just kick on and, and, and push on. Just, just on that, Andy, I want to come to you in one second. But um, you mentioned there Jim Gavin and how he dealt with the likes of Rory Carroll and Mannion and McCaffrey and uh, Connolly stepping away at various stages. When they stepped away, they were gone. Desi Farrell and what he said, he left just enough rope for us to believe that there's a chance <laughs> that Stephen Cluxon might come back. Like this has been a story for minimum two weeks now ever since David Brady come on to off the ball and said the rumor David is Brady, true yeah. David Brady knew did he he, Brady he, knows he knows more than me well but you know what I mean like this story has been rolling on for a couple of weeks now and um, I know Desi Farrell was probably in a tough position with what he said but it's left enough ambiguity out there that people are going to be talking about this can I, can I ask you a question before I get to Andy some people have 
kind of frame this in a certain way that Cluxon will he, won't he, uh, belies a little bit of arrogance on behalf of Stephen Cluxon. Is that something that you'd agree with, that this is actually no. reverse attention-seeking is a phrase that I've heard? How would that sit with you? I could not disagree with that more. <laughs> and from, from knowing Stephen and I, mean, the, I suppose the privilege of playing with him, that's just not his, his style. That's not in his makeup. He, he's been there for, for 20 years, 20 years playing senior inter-county football. He's been at the absolute forefront of, of what Dublin have achieved. He's, you know, you're onto something when they literally start changing rules to try and curb your influence on the game. That, that's kind of the level he's got to. So his dedication and his sacrifice for the team and for, for Dublin GA over the years is, is not in question. It couldn't be in question. I just think it's, and we've spoke about this on the pod in, in the last couple of weeks, you know, Paul Mannion himself stepped away earlier on this year. Other players from other counties have decided to kind of step away. And in a way, you have to say, when you're in, it is all encompassing. It is literally, that's everything you do, every decision you make every day is based around trying to perform for your county. And for Stephen, if he just feels at the minute he can't do it, and not just for Stephen, for any player, if you're not in that headspace and you're not physically or mentally prepared, we don't know what the exact reason is. If you're not in that headspace, you probably are better off stepping away because you're not going to get the best out of yourself. And particularly with the standards that Stephen would hold himself to and within the Dublin changing room as well, I, I absolutely don't agree that it's it's anything to do with attention seeking, that that's just anyone who, who's had the privilege of kind of playing with Stephen or, 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 or have any sort of dealings with him knows that's not, not his style. Uh, but I do, I, I feel the difference from previous years, like you say, where it was, was Rory or, or Jack or Paul Manning going away, they've made the decision clear, they were out. And obviously that conversation probably hasn't happened mm. with Desi. And, and you have to take Desi, he's, he's a very, very straight guy at his word and there probably is a little bit of uncertainty because Stephen might know himself because it's look it is a big decision for any player and um, so, so that's why I think there's probably a little bit of ambiguity and, and I agree the longer it goes on I think people are just going to ask about it because it's yeah. like I say there, there's not a whole lot of other stories going on at the minute in the football championship um, and because of the profile of the player he is as well um, but I think the bottom line besides all of that the, the challenge for Dublin is he's still Dublin's best goalkeeper and he's still one of the best goalkeepers in the country. So without him being there, that is, there's no two ways about it. If he doesn't play in the championship for Dublin again this season, that is a boost to Dublin's competitors. And that's the bottom line. It can get caught up in all the legacy stuff. And, and like, so you can talk about Stephen for, for multiple pods with what he's done for the game. But if he's not there, and it, you have to think with the schedule of this championship and the fact that it's going to be such a condensed... Like they're playing the next game in nine days. The mm. whole championship has finished in six weeks. If he's not back now, it, and we don't know, but but I'd say it's unlikely that you're going to come back in at that stage. And that is going to hurt Dublin, of course. As good as Evan Comfort is, Stephen Cluxton has been the man for the past decade. Yeah. And that's, that's going to be a huge challenge for, for Evan if Stephen doesn't come back, and for Dublin as a whole. There's been some brilliant pieces written about Cluxton in the last couple of weeks. And Andy, I actually have two questions back to back for you here. One of them I'll come back in a minute is from a Maliki Clerken piece that Paddy himself was, was quoted in back in, in May. I'm not going to read you out one of Paddy's quotes. I'm going to read out a quote from an unnamed Dublin teammate in, in that piece. Um, but Andy, when you're, when you're watching this, I'll call it a circus around Stephen Cluxton and all the various pieces that were written in the last week about will he, won't he, is he back, is he not back? Does something like that Possibly, is it too cynical to suggest that it possibly suits Dublin to have a conversation out there other than seven in a row? I know. I, I think um, the nature of the guy, I believe everything Paddy's saying, if I'm being honest about him, just uh, don't know him on a personal basis at all, really just on a competitive basis. And I think he just keeps himself to himself and he's just that sort of character. And I think we all know those characters in our life away from football and just that he's a footballer people are, are wondering but I, I love the way the likes of Paul Finn and Ky, the guys kind of came to his defence at, at the weekend I don't think the boys in the Sunday game said much wrong if I'm being honest I think they, they asked the question the boys kind of jo it's just one of those things he's such he's such an iconic player it's it, it's going to when he retires if he doesn't come back like I think Tomas O'Shea actually sorry now for quoting the Sunday game so much but I, I think he said we could do dedicate a full show to him. could dedicate a full month of shows to him. Like, he's been that important of a player to Dublin. Um, like, us as an opposition, 
the amount of work you had to do on a goalkeeper was insane to try to compete with Dublin. And that's where I think the biggest problem lies for Desi Farr. Um, yes, Paddy's tried to, I suppose, water it off there a tiny bit on Dublin. <laughs> saying, saying that, you know, we've had retirements in the past, the Paul Flynn's, the Jeremy Connolly's when they dropped away, but none of them give to the Dublin team what Stephen Cluxton did. And I don't mean that badly towards anyone else. I, I, you're, you're talking about the most, um, I don't know what the word I'm looking for, the most... Um, it, it is influence. It's influence, isn't it? It's influential footballer of the since 2000 to right to now. Yes, he didn't win his first All Ireland until 20, 2011, but then what he's done since has been. It was like Jim Gavin had a son playing in goals for him. <laughs> like the person, like, you know, this kind of stoic, nothing phases them, controlled personality. Nothing was too good, nothing was too bad. Everything was kind of in between. And to lose a player like that. Yes, and we have we seen it even coming from made a great penalty save against us in Crow Park a couple of years ago in the league. He's a top quality keeper, and in typical Dublin fashion, they've molded the keeper right in the same vein as Cluxton. And Cluxton is a huge influence. But Comfort has never faced the press in an All-Ireland semi-final or final. He's never faced that pressure. He's never faced like he is like this is new. And if Dublin do lose Cluxton. It is hugely, hugely beneficial to the opposition. Like it, it, it's, it's such a boost. Like you basically can squeeze 20 yards further. He's not going to do the Jack Mc... And he is a good kicker. Comfort is a good kicker. But remember the kick out to Howard for McCaffrey to score the goal mm. in 2019? Yeah. That is on a sixpence. Like that ball is kicked to exactly where they want to kick it. McCaffrey is gone. And to do that under pressure is hugely impressive. And to lose a guy like Cluxton for Desi Farron in the second year. But, but, but like you say, Andy, and, and, and we were aware of this as a team as well. Like the kick out and possession has become an absolute cornerstone of, of modern Gaelic football. Like we, we were only talking last week about where do we see Chinks and Kerry's performance this year? Is Shane Ryan going to be in goal or is it going to be Fitzgibbon and, and the challenges they face? With Dublin, and from my own experience of playing with someone like Stephen, he's just like a comfort blanket back there. Mm. For 10 years, and Andy said it, teams would spend weeks, weeks, weeks on end trying to stop his influence on the game. And no matter what, for 10 years, he found the answers. He found, I remember Tyrone had this plan and they were coming up and he sees what's happening in the split second and just kicks it 70 yards over on him. And there's the whole game plan gone. Or Kerry bring. 12 players inside to our, our half, unheard of, like th this style of play. And he still finds the answers. And that, you're right. Evan Comfort is an exceptional young goalkeeper. It really is. He said success, but in Sickers and Cups with DCU, club championships with Bally Moon, underage titles with Dublin. And he's learning from Stephen over the last number of years. And he is going to be one of the top keepers of the country as well. But you, like that influence and just the calming presence that, that Stephen would have on, on his teammates. Of course, look, there's no point in addressing him. Would Dublin rather have him than not? Of course they would. Of, of course, they would. simple as that. Desi would. So it's not great timing on, on that regard, but, but I'd be the same as Paul Flynn or anyone who, who spoke about Stephen. He doesn't owe anyone anything. Anything. He is entitled to make any decision he wants. And if he, if he doesn't want to go back this season and come back next year, He's entitled to do all of it. And, and I think Desi hit the nail on the head. Certain players, I think they have that, they have the right to make those decisions. And Desi knows that. And the Dublin players will know that. And I can see the Dublin supporters and everyone involved in the GA understands the influence and how important he's been to the game. So I just hope, like, as, as a fan now mm -hmm. and as, as, as a friend of his over the last number of years, I'd love to see him back, the same as any Dublin supporter would. But the, the bottom line is, if he's not there, as good as Evan is, we haven't seen him in that white, white hot uh, um, intensity in the championship game. And, and the only way you're going to see it is, is the proof is going to be in the pudding, but we won't know that for a couple of weeks' time at least. But just, just on that, like we have to even call it in last year. Dublin weren't challenged last year really in the championship. Mm. Um, and Paddy, I think you'd agree with that, but they, they, they didn't concede a goal. You know, they didn't concede a goal. Yes, Mead went close at the very first play. A couple of teams went at them in the very first play. He was still pulling off saves. 
No, and he was still organising and pressing and getting the, the kickouts going. And I've had him behind me, and he's he's telling guys where they are and to trust him 100%. And that's only a, per, a half percentage. But for someone like Johnny Cooper or Mick Fitzsimons having clubs behind him, telling them to go right, go left, they trust him more than anybody else. And it's uh, and just to, uh, I suppose, to reiterate Paddy's point, he doesn't know in Dublin football, but he actually, from the greater you being a Mead man, me being a Mead man, he doesn't know football. Like, football have benefited so much from Stephen Cluxton playing football. Like, he, he is absolutely revolutionised the game. Of, well, of if football. you look at, at so the true. top keepers coming through now, you're, mm. you're, you're patting on a Donegal, you're begging it and man in. Niall Morgan, I remember reading Niall Morgan interview a number of years ago and he was like, it's like Cluxton's number one fan. Like, he, yeah. that, that has been his... Legacy. His legacy. It, it is. And I've been absolutely just blessed that he was on my team. Or I got the, the chance to, to play with him, and as players and teammates, we actually feel that it's it's not often you you know you're, you're one of your peers you look at with that sort of reverence. But but I know the Dublin players do, and I know I think anyone involved in Dublin GA does as well. Like so, you can just see his influence on, on players come through, and he has the same influence on Evan Cumberford. And that's why what a what an experience and a learning and an academy nearly for Evan to to have been involved on, under Stephen like that. And you can see he, he's an exceptional keeper in his own right. Um, but 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 I, I think the bottom line is Stephen's probably not going to come out and say anything I wouldn't mm. imagine that, that that's not a style if there, there's uncertainty around it I think Desi it's, he's probably going to be asked about it again when they're preparing for the Mead game next week that's just the nature of it um, but if there's one team that, that kind of deals with or has experience of dealing with this type of thing in the past like say one of Dublin's greatest strengths is they don't really get caught up in the stuff that's going on outside. And I know from our experience, while there was, we were told that Rory and Jack were leaving or Dermot's leaving or Paul Mannion's leaving, there's a bit of disappointment because, Jesus, they're, they're such good players. But, but you, you have to move on pretty quickly. You can't not. The show goes on, you know, and when, people just be hoping he gets back, but we're just, we just don't know at the minute. I, I, I have a couple of questions. I know we're 15 minutes into the podcast. I'm not going to dedicate the whole show to Stephen Cluxon, but I still have a couple of questions that I want to get to from what you both said. Um, Paddy, I've, done, I've clocked it up. I've done my maths. Um, Stephen Cluxon's eight All-Ireland medals are the 76th All-Ireland medals to leave the Dublin dressing room, the Dublin match day panel in the last 18 months. It's like I know it's crazy numbers, but 76 All-Ireland medals from... Bernard Brogan to Ono Garrett to Jack McCaffrey to Jim McConnelly to Paul Mannion to Darren Daly to Paddy Andrews, Michael Darren McCauley, Keno Sullivan, Kevin McMiniman, Stephen Cluxon. I'm not even including Paul Flynn. I'm not including Jim Gavin and his backroom team. <laughs> on, the, on the pitch, 76 all Ireland medals. Like, in terms of, you know, you've talked about the standards in A versus B games. You've talked about, you know, encouraging players and bringing them along. The rest of the counties around the country, even me, have to be looking at Dublin and saying, we should be able to get at them. <laughs> well, look, you'll see in the next couple of weeks. You know, and that's me play Dublin. That's going to be a big game. And I know me were, were kind of frustrated with how they panned out in last year's Leinster final. They felt they, they would have had a strong chance and Dublin performed. And I'm obviously biased. I, I think Dublin have risen to the challenges over the last number of years when there's been question marks there as well. But, mm. but I think if you just look at the evolution of sport, all those players are there for over 10 years. You know, nobody, nobody, not even Stephen Cluxton, who was literally Superman, can go on forever. So that's just the, the nature of it. We had a brilliant Kerry team and a brilliant Tyrone team in the 90s, and, and eventually those players move on. And the challenge for, for any coach and any team is being able to bring through younger guys to, to take up the baton and take up the leadership role and, and keep those standards high. And that's the secret of Dublin's success over the last number of years and the, the, I suppose the genius of what Jim Gavin did and what Desi has done since he's been in there is they've been able to keep that success despite losing those players. I remember Dublin's, Jim Gavin's first couple of all Ireland. It was Paul Flynn and Bernard Brogan and Dermot Connolly's team and Michael Dermot Connolly's team. They were the leaders of that team and all of a sudden, without us even knowing it, they were kind of moving on and all of a sudden it became... James McCarthy's and Dean Rocks and Brian Fenton's team. And now all of a sudden it's Niall Scully's and Conor Callahan's team. It, that is the hardest thing for any coach and any elite sports team is to keep the conveyor belt going and keep winning and keep revolutionising. Look, Sir Alex Ferguson's one of the greatest examples of that. 
in, in a different sport that, that he could just keep building teams to keep winning. And that's what has been Dublin's greatest success over the last number of years, that you've listed off guys there that will go down as some of the most iconic players of their generations. But Dublin have still managed to win All-Ireland. That's a credit to the underage coaches and it's a credit to the young guys coming through themselves because it's not an easy thing as a young player coming in and, and you're Conor Callahan and you're being asked to be the new Bernard Brogan. That is a, that is a big ask for any young player. Evan Comerford is going to go through it now if he's being asked to be the new Stephen Cluxton. And you've got to be mentally strong and you've got to be mentally believe in yourself that I don't want to be the next Stephen Cluxton. I'm going to be the best version of me. And that's what Jim was, was brilliant at doing and the coaches. And it's what Desi did so well last season. Like That is a hard job taking over from Jim Gavin and they go and win the All-Ireland in a COVID disrupted season. And that's going to be the challenge over the next, hopefully from Dublin's point of view, six, seven weeks uh, as they chase another All-Ireland. But that's, that's sport. Older players move on. Dublin have had a big turnover, but there's some young guys that have come through. And even at the weekend, four or five guys getting game time. That's the challenge. That is mm. what's going to be expected of them. Dublin don't want to not win the All-Ireland because they're in transition. Yeah. The standards are going to be, we, we want to win the All-Ireland. We're not looking to say, oh, we're in transition, so, so carry our favourites. That, that, that won't be the thoughts in the Dublin dressing room, but that is the challenge for them. So Not Dublin, I had actually, hadn't actually thought about that. Dublin are in transition, I suppose. That is the case, like they are in transition at the moment. Well, they've won six all Ireland's in a row. But are they, are they in transition? Trans- it's not a bad transition. It's not a bad transition. In terms of their players, they've had, like I say, they've had a huge turnover in terms of experience and players. But the standards have stayed the same and they're still winning championship games. So... Like transition can be lost and it kind of can be an excuse for certain teams or mm. in other sports and say, oh, they're in transition. Give them time. Dublin aren't looking for time. Desi Farrell's not looking for time. The young players aren't looking for time. They're looking to win the All-Ireland again. So, so that won't be an excuse. But if you look at the player turnover, of course, like you say, many 76 All-Ireland medals, that's a hell of a lot. But they're still going to expect and to win the All-Ireland this year. That's going to be the goal. I think if, um, if Desi manages to win the All-Ireland this year, I think it's some achievement. I have to say, I think um, I think they're going to be there with McCarthy, Khan, Kilkenny, Scully, these guys, Cooper. Benton. Yeah, it's it, it's amazing. Like that talent is still amazing. But the Jack McCaffrey thing now and Paul Mannion thing becomes big because Cluxton is gone. It becomes a bigger issue now that they're gone because Evan, however good he is, Evan Comerford isn't going to be as influential as Stephen Cluxton, in my opinion. OK, if Johnny Cooper hasn't played much football this year, McMahon is good, but he's not as good as Johnny Cooper, in my opinion. Uh, McDay did exceptionally well last year, was never pressed. He cannot do what Jack McCaffrey did in 2019. So He's to, also injured. He's also injured, but my point is, Lehith and Byrne and these guys are good, good players. But they were replacing other players with Scully, O'Callaghan, Kilkenny. Now, if the opposition can't smell blood this year, if they can't smell, we're as well packing in because there is, all of a sudden, there is a chance. I know it's not even the loss of Stephen Cluxton as, as much, in my opinion. It's what that, I suppose, you start thinking then, okay, they have lost the book on the screen. <laughs> but they have lost... I might even put in this category. No, I know, I, I know. <laughs> I understand, but like, Paddy, like you coming off the bench with, with Kevin McMenamum and these guys... You yeah. always had to come up with a plan. When McCauley came off the bench in midfield, like that was a different, you had to have a different plan. Had to, we didn't have a plan. We didn't have a plan for Howard. Do you know what I'm saying? They were big, big, big players. Uh, proved it last year. Really good player. And I know he's injured now. But when Jack McCaffrey was playing, you literally had to put a player, American Jack yeah. McCaffrey. And that is just huge. And now with Stephen Cluxton, Ever Comerford, even if Comerford's kickouts are as good as Cluxton's, Every team is taking a step forward there. They're taking a step forward. Can I ask you about that? Um, in that Maliki Clerken piece that I cited from the Irish Times, it was around Cluxon's 20th anniversary. I'm not sure if he predicted or if he knew that we were going to have these conversations a few weeks later, but there's a quote in it from an unnamed Dublin teammate. Stephen's thought processes when it came to kickouts are sometimes even nearly too complex for some of the players. He was always probing players and evolving the kickout because he doesn't want the opposition to work out what Dublin are doing. So he changes it up each year. He's paranoid about it. Paranoid that he would get worked out. That's why Mayo always freaked him out a bit. They were so good at pressing up high at changing what he was seeing. He knew that if he hit on a game, if they hit on a game where they worked him out, then it would be the difference between winning and losing an All-Ireland final. And we have a question in 
Andy from Shane McDonald. Can you get Andy's insight into clucks and kickouts as he was probably the closest man to him for so long inside in the full forward line? Yeah, as I said, I just stood to his left, to my, <laughs> my right, the weakest position. We, he was looking into the stand. At the yeah, time. Right. <laughs> See, you have, to, you have to realise what we have, right? So Dublin have absolute animal athletes around the middle of the field. Like, they're serious athletes. Always had it from Flynn to Conley to Fenton to McCarthy to McCauley. Always had guys that could run. But in our middle eight, we always had guys that could run as well. So you had Tom Parsons, you had Shane O'Shea, you had Jason Doherty, you had Kevin McLaughlin, you had Lee Keegan, we, Donny Vaughan, you had huge, and Paddy Durkin later on, you, you Jeremy O'Connor, you had huge athletes from there. So we had probably the size to go after them. We had the, I suppose, the ability to, to challenge them. And we, we used to absolutely study what we were doing against Cluxton. Like we, we thought about it, we really uh, like we didn't go chasing fellas like remember we were describing the Mead press last year where Mead Menton chased Fenton into the 45 left huge space for Khan we used to talk and plan and maybe put a fourth man in on the half forward line so that you used to put Stephen under a tiny bit of pressure there that's what we used to do but as Paddy said he used to work it out like the only time I I'll tell you a good one the only time I thought Clubson really really got freaked was the first game in 2015. We that was the one when we came back from seven. Cluxton was the last freaked, fan. He was yeah. freaked out. It was the first time I ever seen him freaked out. And then somebody went down injured. We got a we got a ball blocked down to put us a point up. Someone went down injured. Cluxton's gathered himself. And then he was 100 percent again for the last. I think he had one more kick out after and he just nailed it. So, how, did you, how could you recognize that he was freaked? Because I was in the stand that day. I was looking down from above. I can feel the, the noise. Oh, yeah. I, think we, I, think, I think we all were. I yeah, yeah. Stephen, I think I, we all were. I, I think it, there, was a, there was a whole kind of um, fulcrum of things that happened. Basically, Dublin were out the gate with the game and then all of a sudden we came back. So there was a bit of that. Did, we, seven, what, did we go seven up? Yeah. We seven seven up, up. Yeah. Kevin McManaman got a toe poke goal. Keegan yeah, gets the goal like, too, doesn't he? Yeah. And, and then the first uh, game. We, with we, the, yeah, we talk about uh, home and house. Yeah. So, so, and then Cluxton just gets a tiny bit freaked out. It was the only time I saw him. Like, he, he often lost his composure maybe in a game for a kickout, but by the next kickout, he was fine. But there, it was two or three kickouts in a row. We got him one after another, and we had a chance. But like every other time, he found a way. Like, I think we challenged G in 16, Paddy, in the, in the replay. And then he just found a way in the second half. Himself and Cooper just worked this kick to corner back. He kept giving it to Cooper. Well, that, that was it, Andy. That, that was it. And, and like from our experience, then the other end of the pitch, we can see this happen. Like we can see Carrier putting, all of a sudden, I'm not even being marked. And there's there's 12 Kerry guys in our half, or Tyrone are roaring and shouting, and they're the 15 lads nearly in, in our half. And he just figures it out. He just That's his preparation, that's his dedication prep, to, yeah. his prep, to yeah. what he's trying to do. But it just, it does, you're right. Because I, I know from my own experience, the conversations you have after the game, it just gives such confidence to the rest of the team. Because you're like, this guy has seen it all. No matter what comes out, what the opposition are trying to do, and you're right, today, the analysis that goes into games, particularly on the kickouts and things like that, every team is trying to figure it out. Every team is trying to steal a march. The best teams win opposition kickouts. The best teams keep the ball on their own kickouts. Like I said, we literally just touched on this last week and the challenge for Kerry and the uncertainty around their number one. Is that going to be a weakness? Whereas with Dublin, you never, until maybe it's gone, you don't realise that you had 20 years of just an absolute... We realise it. Canvas. We, we, we realise it. Realize yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it is. It's such, it's such a big position in modern Gaelic football. So I can even so look. Yeah. Yeah, he, like he's even marking Tommy Walsh at the end of the drone game in 2019. If you remember that, there was an image that did the rounds from behind the goals that he was it's that ready for that. When we talk about, and I want to move on now to the double performance, but when we, if you're the Mead analyst sitting down, and I actually don't know who the Mead opposition analyst is at the minute, but if you're the Mead analyst sitting down and you're looking at Stephen Com or Evan Comfort's kickouts, Stephen Comfort, Evan Comfort's kickouts, I've already done your job for you. I've gone back to the the only time Evan Comfort's really been challenged in a Dublin jersey, and that was down in Tralee in February 2019. And I watched that match back earlier on. And Andy, I don't know whether you remember doing the analysis on Comfort ahead of playing them in the league a few weeks later, but Kerry didn't even fully press the kick out that day, and they got a lot of joy off it. They got a goal and four points straight off Comfort. Um, there was three points, three kickouts in a row in the second half that Kerry pressed at certain stages, and they turned over, they, they, they forced Comfort to go long, and they turned them over twice. 
they intercepted a kick out and Tommy Walsh got a score. There was two high balls that came in on him. One of them led to a goal. He didn't come for it. Um, what, was there anything in 2019 when you are going to play them in the league? Did you focus on comfort going into that or was there any point focusing on comfort? Not essentially. Uh, we, we like In the league, for us, it was way different than the championship. We wouldn't have put that level of analysis into the league just because what we talked about before. Yeah. Was, one, you don't realise who you have. Other things, it's been done on Zoom and it's been done remotely and stuff like that. So we didn't absolutely analyse the league the way we used to do the championship. The championship could be done for nearly six, eight weeks out of, from a game. Like, we'd be analysing kickouts in general. You could be having Morgan kickouts. You'd have different kick. Donny Buckley would have different kickouts throughout the course of a session. Like, so he could have a Morgan kickout. He could have a Began kickout. He could have a Cruxton kickout. He could call them and you'd have to defend them. So you could have different stuff. But that would be more championship stuff for us. With Comerford, like, I think the point Paddy is making is, is key here, Tommy, is that Comerford is going to come under pressure. He is going to freak out a tiny bit of times. We're not saying Clux, that didn't happen to Cluxton. It did, but he used to work. It, it, it's if he can work it out. And we're not going to know that from Evan Comfort until this actually yeah. happens. That, that's where I think other teams have a, ch- uh, a chance. Like It's not that Stephen Cluxton was infallible. I think the actual attraction to Cluxton, which I should have known, but I do, right? The attraction to Cluxton is that he was fallible. Joe, there was an, an area to him where... You could go, do, do, even in his early years, there was a bit of weakness. He might come out with a ball, you know, do, that sort of, but he always, he always worked it out. And that to me, to me is the, is the, 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 the mind of a, a really, really great player and internally a really, a great coach on the pitch. And that's what, that's what I always seen him as. I just thought he was just always a fella that when you could make hay on him, you had to make hay on him because in the next five minutes, He's going to have this problem solved, so you need to do it when you have a chance. You know I mean? And um, and I think Comerford we won't know about Comerford until that actually until that moment comes. That was only his third championship game at the weekend. He, he played the Leinster final in 2018 against Leash, um, and he played Super Eights against Tyrone as well. In in uh, was that 2018 as well? Do, those two years, but he's obviously played a couple of league games. Like Dublin have been grooming him for a couple of years, as sure. you said earlier on. They've they've been they've been getting Evan, Evan Comerford ready. So um, we'll come back to that game again. Um, before Dublin Mead and before Kildare West Mead were looking into those games a wee bit. Can we go to Wexford Park at the weekend and uh, Dublin Wexford? We were probably all following it in GA Go. There was a couple of great moments. Paddy, I don't know whether you felt them as great moments where you could hear the Wexford accent and the roars and the screams <laughs> as they turned over a couple of Dublin lads and they put in a serious shift. Like I think they were leading until the 23rd minute, three points to two. I know Fenton kicked the first point, but how did you feel watching that Dublin performance? Me? Yeah, sorry, Paddy. Yeah, you. Um, I, I, I think, look, for the standards they had set and have set over the last number of years, it was a bit sloppy. Um, there, there's no two ways about that. To only score 15 points for Dublin is very rare, particularly this time of the season. You know, the, 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 there's no with conditions. It's summer football. You'd expect Dublin to probably rack up a, few, a bigger score than that. I think there was just uncharacteristic mistakes. I think sloppy was the word that was used. And, and, and I think that's what, what Desi and the coaches and and the players themselves, to be fair, will be aware of that, that, that there's no way they're going to be overly happy with, with how that went because the standards are so high. And like I say, that will be the focus this week more so than whatever's going on outside with Stephen or anyone else like that. I thought their handling was a little bit poor. I thought their, their kick pass, their execution of the skills, which is the absolute cornerstone of what makes them such a good team, was a little bit off. Um, and it might actually be the worst thing for them that okay, it's a bit of an eye-opener. You know, Kerry have been kind of shooting the lights out and everything seems to be so smooth and clicking for them. Whereas for Dublin now, it's like, right, the championship started. We have a big, big game against Mead in in 10 days' time. Mead seem to have bounced back themselves from from a poor finish to the National League. So there is a big challenge there now. And for Dublin, that will focus the minds. I think the positive side of things, like we we got game time into some of these players, Sean McMahon, Pedro Crawford Byrne, the Baskells, Aaron Byrne, these guys, Cormac Costello got another full game under his belt, Dean Rock got back from injury. So there's positives in that regard. The biggest influence for me was Brian Howard coming back and, and getting back to being the Brian Howard of, of two or three years ago, the All Star, a real Rolls Royce of a player. Like, if we're talking players are leaving the Dublin squad and Keno Sullivan's gone and other 
Dublin can't afford not to have Brian Howard back this year. Like last year himself and, and Mannion were kind of coming in and out and they probably weren't at their peak. We all Brian expected Howard, Howard to, to come back and start and he was named to start in that all in semi final against Cavan and he didn't. Like, Yeah, and, and that's why it is important. Like I say, maybe the depth that Dublin have had in previous years where they could get away with that. They, they'll need Brian Howard back playing well and it's good to see. You're hoping that like Robbie McDade's got a bit of a knock. Does that put pressure on John Small trying to come back from his injury? Johnny Cooper, or Merchant and these guys. So it is. It's, it, I'd say Desi Farrell, to be fair, after the game, despite dealing with the clubs and questions, he might be overly perturbed with how that game panned out because it's, it will focus the minds that Dublin are kind of seeing, Mayo racking up big scores, Donegal are looking impressive, Kerry are obviously the, been the real form team over the last kind of six weeks. Dublin will, will get back to the drawing board now and make sure that there's a significant improvement in their, their, even just their basic skills and their slickness and their cohesion for when they play Mead on, on Sunday week in Crow Park. Andy, we've spoken a lot about the likes of Armagh and Preston this year and, and Dublin at various times in the league, but Division 4 opposition put it up to them for long stages of their games. Like Antrim played very well against Armagh for times. I know it was a, it been 13 points at the end of it. And Wexford, do you know, they got a couple of great early scores and they tagged on a couple more at the end, but they struggled beyond the halfway line, we'll say. But they did put serious pressure on Dublin and forced a lot of mistakes. Were you surprised by anything in that dublin Wexford game at the weekend? No, I, I was surprised that it was so close. When you when you look back on it, though, there was goal chances there for Dublin and it could have been a much wider much wider, uh, wider gap of context as goal and one or two others. Yeah. Uh, was there a Pat Coffee Burn? Yeah, Pat Coffee Burn. I won the yeah. first half. Yeah. Which in, uh, if them chances are taken, then it's it's a different story. But what I would be saying is that it d- d- taking Dublin out of Crow Park, it's not going to make. I don't think it's going to make much changes to results. But I think the best challenge he got last year, Paddy, or Paddy, obviously from me in the final, but was in for, against Westmead down at Port Leash. I think it was a really good, decent game. Um, mm. I think you were comfortable. Of course, you were comfortable. You were comfortable last Sunday, but it was a challenge. And like Westmead can see that, okay, we're 10, 11 points back here. Uh, Wexford can see we're eight, nine points here. It gives them a, a chance to aim towards. If Wexford go up and play in Crow Park last week, lads, that oh, game, 30 points. It is. And, and, that, and it's not because the pace of the game, the, like, for, for example, me as a forward, my best games always came east of the Shannon. They always came out of Connacht. Like, they never came at, at home. Because for an inside forward, Paddy will tell you. Ah, uh, 100%. Like, Jesus. You're top of the ground, you're turning, you're twisting. Like, you look at Kilkenny last week, he can't get away from his man the way he wants to. Con isn't getting the freedom. Scully isn't getting the freedom. And it's, it's they're struggling. And the, the, the scores, are, but like, you can see next week now, or the week after next, like the ball is coming in, Connor's running out, he does the double back, it's in over the head. It's cool. You can see it already happening. And it, for for me, for the game to grow on Leinster, Dublin, like them games, like down in Wexford, like you heard, you heard the cheer from the Wexford fans. Like, well, how many fans? <laughs> Two to 500 people. And 500, they, I think. Yeah. yeah, it was like if they were winning the game at half time. Like they hadn't scored since about the eighth minute. And the, you know, <laughs> at the roof, like, it was amazing. And for them players, like you, you, you want them to go into the gym. You want Roe wants to go into the gym in um, in November, December, or from now, to be honest, into the gym. Yeah. Like they, you remember them things. You remember that cheer. You remember the appreciation the player, the people have for you going in. And to me, it's a, it, it, was, it was a real special moment. I was a bit pissed off, to be honest, with the Sunday game that they joined the game two points all. You know, poor old Wexford, like they went three two up, like you know, show their first three points to show the people that these Wexford guys can actually play the game. They're they're there to compete. Um, but for Division Four sides, Antrim and themselves to put up such a good show, and again, it's not pandering to them or anything like that. In the McGinley, Shane Roach, these guys should get a you know, should get a pat on the back. The way that their teams conditioned and ready to play was uh, was great to see for the championship. Yeah, and like Wexford. Talk about a county that have really hit the depths. They've had such a tough time with, with Joe you know, Paul Galvin went in there and it looked like it was going to be a boost and that didn't work out the way I suppose everyone probably wanted it to work out. Um, and then Roach obviously came in and they even had a tough time in the league. Like they, they've had a tough year of it, but they put in that performance. Um, and it was, it was so interesting to watch. Like I was watching on my phone on, on GA Go and I had to go back and watch the first 10 minutes again because the coverage is crap where I was in Mayo at the time. But <laughs> like it, it, it was so interesting to watch Cormac Costello, James McCarthy. 
mm. kick a ball over the end line. Brian Howard messing up passes. It, it, like it was actually like this is this is a match. Yeah, them uh, Dublin boys aren't used to the wind. In Crow Park, there's no wind. There's <laughs> <laughs> always a wind down at the hill. There is. Hill is there a wind? Is there a wind? Yeah. Yeah. Is there down a wind? the hill, there is. Yeah. Is there a wind in Crow Park? Is there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is. I yeah, but you only get it when you go inside the twenty-one. You'd kick a nice. <laughs> <laughs> Neither of us ever left the twenty-one, Andy. So we know all about it. Paddy, you, you obviously had no say in, uh, like the players have no say in whether or not you played in Crow Park or a neutral venue. That's, there's, <laughs> no, loads, there's loads of reasons. Despite what people think we did. There's, there's plenty of reasons. And I'm, I'm sure it never really crossed your minds at all. But the benefits of playing <laughs> on a ground that you know inside out, like the benefits of playing in Crow Park, we, like championship match of championship match, like it has to be huge in terms of muscle memory, in terms of knowing where you are, being comfortable in the in the place. Like, can you can you sit back now and recognise how big an advantage that may be? No, I was I was the same as Andy as as a forward. I I, I played better on Crow Park, definitely. Did. It just kind of sealed up my game, and, and I think if you look at the the speed w- with which Dublin play at, and the, the slickness when Dublin are at the best, the speed they move the ball, the speed their players have, the athleticism. Crow Park, of course, it does. Of course, that suits them, but. I know from my own experience as well, and 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 they'll touch on this as well. Some of our most enjoyable games were national league games on the road. Like we had some serious battles at Mayo over in Castle Bar, and it's like Crow Park is, is a brilliant place to play. But you know, particularly for Leinster Championship games over the last five, six, seven years, it's just 30, 40,000 people there. It's actually very surreal. It's, it's quite dead. Whereas. We were going down and playing National League games in Tralee and in, in, in Castle Bar, up in Oma. The atmosphere was electric. You, you know what I mean? And, and as players, we actually loved doing that. And, and the enjoyment, that, and invariably, we did well. We got results and coming out of Killarney or coming out of Tralee or coming out of Castle Bar with a win. That was a hugely kind of enjoyable thing for a Dublin player. But I, I think, look, if you're playing in the summer and with the style that Dublin play at their very best, and particularly for forwards, Crow Park, of course, that's where you, that's where you want to play. So is it an advantage or not? Would it make a huge difference in in, in the majority of Leinster Championship games? I don't think, I don't really think it does. Um, and as players, it, it was honestly, it was, again, it's, believe it or not, it's not something we ever really would have spoke about. You know, I, the first round of the Championship, we're down to wherever, Port Leash or, or Tullamore or wherever you used to play. That was supposed to be kind of just get on with it, you know. Um, Conor McGrainer has a question he wants to know in the first half where the dubs rattled with the miss-free shot selection Howard's ballooned kick over I think McCarthy had a, a, a kick over the end line as well could you define it as being rattled or was it just ring rusty how would you would you have seen it as that did Wexford do anything to, to get at them I think just Dublin were sloppy and that, that's why it's, it's when it happens it's so rare that it actually does happen like we We've given them plenty of credit on this part throughout the season so far. Their first game against Ross Common, how clinical they were in the National League. That was their first game of the season and they hit the ground running. They were excellent in what they were doing. So Sunday was just, yeah, credit to Wexford because you could see Shane Roach, and I know Shane Roach well, he spent time in college with him. He would have those boys absolutely revved up. The crowd had the players revved up and you could see Wexford were absolutely giving them their fill of it. There was probably a bit of that, and then also just a little bit of sloppiness in terms in terms of the execution. Um, and Dublin would be absolutely aware of that. And that's why I think for, for Desi, if I'm in Desi Farrell's position, I don't think that's the worst thing that's happened in that, that game at the weekend that they can kind of say, you can give the guys a bit of a rocket this week and say, right, we're playing again in, in nine days' time. That performance wasn't good enough. It's not at the standards we're talking about. And whether you're, like we've said this, whether you're three or four new players getting their, their opportunity and Pat O'Coffey Byrne and, and, and Sean McMahon and these guys, just because they're new on the panel doesn't mean that that's acceptable if, if, they're, if they're making bad decisions or they're, or they're sloppy on the ball. Um, so that's, I think Desi will actually be, be relatively happy that he can focus on that and the players most certainly will. But no, it was, it was uncharacteristic and it's not something you're accustomed to when, when you watch them play. And, and they, were, they were sloppy, Paddy, going forward with the ball in hand, mm. who were very tight at the back. Um, John, let's, like, they held Wexford to three or four points, I think, for John. Did Wexford score the third point probably in around the 15th minute? Or yeah. Was, yeah, in around the fifth, And then they didn't score again to mid four. What was yeah. it? They, they tagged on two points in the 68 and 70 yeah. minutes. You know, yeah. you know, so, so Dublin, yes, were sloppy, but their, their, their structure was good. Their, yeah. their defence was good. Um, 
it, go forward to report. Um, but it, listen, to it, 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 all in all, I think Paddy's nailed it there. What Desi Farrell yeah. can say, go forward, and their, their structure's still in a good place. So the rest of the answer, um, there's a bit of buzz about Kildare at the minute. They, John Mahon's uh, awfully been knocked out, unfortunately. So Kildare 115, awfully 13 points. Uh, in Westmead, they were, were down at half time mm. and they came out and they they really put it up to leash in the second half. 320 to 110. And obviously there's been a big fallout since Mike Quirk has stepped aside. Uh, probably one of the most uh, brightest inter-county voices at the minute. Somebody young who's getting a chance. Much the same as Enda McGinley, it just shows the perils of inter-county management at the minute. You dip your toe in a county and things can go things go wrong so quickly, especially during COVID. It's been such a tough time for, for managers out there. Like Quirk was actually doing quite well, I think, at the start with Leash. And then once momentum went, it all just slipped away from them. Like they were a point up at half time and, and Westmead came out and done that. Like Andy, you've seen you've mentioned that Westmead are a very well coached team. You've seen them up close once or twice. What way would you lean with that Kildare Westmead semi final at this juncture? Oh, you go go Kildare, and um, the pace they showed the last the last day against Offaly when the game was in the was it really the melting pot bar? For some reason, to do stupid things and be down to thirteen men, bar that, and uh, that game was over. And some of the pace and the forwards, I just think Kildare and Lee should be doing a lot better than what they showed. And I think Mike. Mike, Mike Quirk, I think sometimes the benefit of what a, what a manager's done with uh, with a team is only shown in the next phase, you know. So I think I think the benefits will come on as uh, John. We've alluded to players move on, you know. Ross Monday, who's been huge for Leash over years, uh, Begley, uh, all these guys are all just getting to that age where they're you're, you're probably trying to keep them, yeah, and you're probably, probably trying to blood new players. So it's really tough. Leash should be doing better. I think Mike Quirk mm. knows. Should be doing better, um, but it did. Joe, you, you, you'd feel bad for him. But in terms of the, the Kildare Westmead, you'd, you'd have to go Kildare all day just with the pace they have. I think Westmead are good, I think they're well, um, well structured in, in, in terms of their defense. But then when they come out to play, they seem to concede quite a bit at the back. So when they came out to play against Cork, they conceded hugely against Cork, mm. and they came out to play the last day against Leash in the first half and Leash scored quite a bit going the other way so I think Kildare will just have too much of them going forward with the running lines and I, I think Kildare should win Paddy Mead racked up a, a big score against Longford it was in Navin um, there was moments in that game where like, Longford had a, had a big chance I think for a penalty at one stage um, when the game was quite close and then before half time Mead racked on 1-5 in the space of 4 or 5 minutes and then blew them away in the second half my perspective, the most impressive part was the Mead press and the long for kick out. Paddy Collins, a very highly regarded goalkeeper, and Mead annihilated him in that regard. What can Mead do to hurt Dublin? Oh, well, like it was, a, it was a very important game for Mead. And there was kind of murmurs with, with how the league campaign finished for them, the kind of the, the flatness of that, not getting promoted. That, that was a setback for Mead. There's no doubt about it. Andy McAdoo would have wanted Mead to get back into Division One. The way they were beaten by Kildare. If you look six months before, they wiped Kildare in the Leinster semi-final, scoring five goals. So that, that that was a challenge for them, and it was interesting to see the reaction. I was actually really impressed with them. Mm. And you could see Mead, their attacking style last year was getting lots of pace, lots of runners, and going for goals, and scoring goals. And even, we touched it, as much as the Leinster final didn't pan out in the end for them, the first 10, 15 minutes, and Dublin, we were aware of this, that these guys are going to come at you, they're fit, and the Mackin has been there a number of years. Killing O'Sullivan and these guys, Jordan Morris, they've got dangerous forwards. And Sunday was me getting back to that. You know, he scored four goals. They could have had a hell of a lot more as well. Look, as poor as maybe Longford were, but you could see the progress that Mead had made. It was just, and that this was what Andy McAdee and Mead supporters would have been hoping for, that it was just a bit of a blip at the end of the National League against Kildare. And look, they'll, they'll go in with renewed confidence. As much as... Dublin are going to be favourites for that game. There's no two ways about it. But me to be looking at going, did we do ourselves justice in last year's Leinster final? Because there, there was there was big coverage about them that they'd taken over as the second best team in, in Leinster. They'd really put Kildare to the sword. I was like, okay, Mead, three or four years into Andy Cycle, are going to put it up to the dubs. And it just didn't happen for them. They've got a brilliant, brilliant opportunity and a bit of momentum going into the game on Sunday week. So I think they're going to be trying to bring lots of runners, lots of pace off the shoulder. And he, and he's touched on it. Dublin's defence, despite the, the changes in personnel and things like that, was really solid at the weekend. Um, and they'll be prepared for that running game. But that's 
made her kind of come in and can they fire a few shots? Because I know they were how frustrated, how disappointed they were with last year's Leinster final and they've got an opportunity now and like, like we've touched on earlier in this pod, people are asking questions about Dublin now where that hasn't been the case for God knows how long. So it's, they're going to go in confident, I feel. Eh? We'll probably talk about these games in more depth um, the week beforehand, but Andy, from this from this stage, like, what are you what are you what are you saying to me? Are you saying to press Comerford? Are you saying to go for goal? Well, like, what what are the things they have to do? Yeah, to beat Dublin, it, it, they have to score four or five goals. If I'm being honest with you, um, yeah. I don't like to press and Comerford is fine, but they're not going to be on the ball that often. Uh, Dublin are going to hold the ball. Like I think against Wexford, they probably you put uh, up a new record. I think Paddy was it <laughs> one and a half minutes or five minutes of the ball. Um, yeah. Just huge amount of time on the ball at the start of the second half. Um, so I think for me, they have to really identify what we are going to do when Dublin have the football. Um, how we're going to conserve our energy. Where, what spaces we want to mark. Who we want to go really tight on. Is it worth their while? pushing Comfort, even though he's a new keeper, is it worth their while doing it? Because is it going to leave too much space in behind? Joe, so they really need to think about what they're going to do when they don't have the ball. And then when they do have the ball, it has to be, it, yeah, they have to just, they have to attack at speed like what they did against Longford and they have to go for goal, in my opinion. They, um, they, have, to be, they have to be clinical. And like I said, they, they, you're not going to get, and this is not just for me, this is any team and it's going to be the same. If you're playing Dublin, if you're playing Kerry, you've got to accept that the players they have and the quality they have, they're going to have the majority of the ball. If you're looking to cause an upset, it's the same for any kind of underdog commentary. You have to take your chances. You're not going to get many of them. Mead had, you know, a very hectic start to the Leinster final last year. They had two or three chances where if it's one more pass, they might get a palm goal or that they kind of snatch at shots because they're nearly, they're panicking. They can't believe they're in that situation. If they're going to have any chance next Sunday, that they need to be ultra clinical in front of the post um, because you're right like Dublin are going to score more than 15 points next Sunday that will be a focus for them they won't be happy how their attack the, the lack of cohesion there the kind of missed opportunities decision making so, so you can bet your, your bottom dollar Dublin are going to be more impressive up front so made exactly what Andy's saying you have to you have to make the most of every opportunity you're going to get Dublin haven't conceded a goal. Is it right? Is, the, is this right? It's saying that Tommy in championship since the first game in the All Ireland final 2019. Yeah, that was that's like that's, Spillane, madness. Yeah. that's madness. Like, do you know that is like that is madness, and it's uh, it's something that goes unnoticed because Dublin are so clinical up top. It goes unnoticed how clinical they are at the back, and like teams got chances last year and they didn't take them to have any chance. Like literally any chance. You're not you're not going to score two zero points, like 20, 20 points straight. So it has to be a two fourteen, a three eleven to, to have any chance of beating this Dublin team. There's a, a yarn just when you mentioned that Spillane goal and that Malik Clerken piece about Cluxon spending two hours watching slow mo replays of his feet. What he did wrong when Killian Spillane scored that goal against Dublin. Um, it's in that Malachy Clerken piece. So there's some great stories in that. I, I actually mentioned when I clocked up those seventy six All Ireland medals earlier on that Dublin are missing. I mentioned Kevin McMiniman's name in there. Um, and that's because McMiniman is, is gone as well with the Irish boxing team to Tokyo as part of his job for the next couple of weeks. McMiniman might be back. You know, he, he may not. But uh, he'll be, he's out of the, the picture, I suppose, for a couple of weeks with work um, heading to Tokyo. So uh, that's... Yeah, like that just shows the, the madness of what you've done, Paddy, over the last couple of years. Like He has been an absolute mainstay of Fulcrum, the gold court. Jeez, and like, I didn't even know that. You know, it's... Um, <laughs> That's a report in the Irish News. Uh, another another piece in the Irish News, Neil Lochran has the line, is that Conor McManus's injury isn't as bad as initially feared uh, mm. in terms of his comments. So they're hoping that he's going to be okay. Like essential for Monaghan against um, it's against Armagh that they they'll be facing. So Armagh kept bet Antrim four fifteen to fourteen points, and Monaghan got by for Manor by ten points one twenty one to fourteen. Jack McCarran scoring the goal for Monaghan there. Let's talk Galway was common lads. Um, Go away 211, Roscommon 12 points. We have a message in on Instagram. It's not a question. It's from Phelan. He starts it off by saying, not a question, but by God did Andy nail it with his Sean Kelly comments. <laughs> <laughs> like it, it's, I, I, was, I was driving to the to Connacht final last year 
and my good friend Barry Kelly, who, who played for our club team for years and then was playing for Salt Hill. So he, he knows, he, he actually came back to us last year again, but he, he knows his goal with football. Um, his dad was really good friends with John Amman. He used to be the eyes in the stand for him and stuff like that. So he knows his football. And before the game, I, I, I was doing the bit for off the ball and went in and I just rang him and I said, who, who, who were the guys here? You know, and he said, Kelly was unbelievable for Moy Cullen. Moy Cullen was club. And for yeah. the championship, he said he was the best player in the championship. He said he's playing cornerback. He said, Andy, he's, he's a new man since he went back there. You know, he's brilliant. So I watched him for the whole game. He, he is literally... The, the main guy in their team. He, 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 he's a good tackler. He, he, he's, but any time they're under pressure in the back, they now have himself and Silk in the two corners who, who are serious, serious ball players and they can get the ball out. And for Mayo, it's, it, it's about stopping this guy. I, I, I think a re- recording the game, last, la, the last kind of final, I think Gaul scored six points in the first half and I think he was directly assisted or directly involved in four of them attacks. Like he is the main man coming off the back of the of the, the midfield. He's got a forwards eye in his head because of his, his history of playing there. Yeah. But he can do two things. He can run beyond the play, but he also can hold behind the play and link it with a kick. So he reminds me a tiny... He's not the same sort of player, but he remind, he's a bit of a lacy sort of sort of player too, the way he can link the play. And he, he's just very, very elusive. You wrote that he, he tracks the play as well. Like a, Did you mention like a scrum half in your, like, in your mirror he, piece? Yeah, he's like a scrum half and he just follows it up. And it's um, he was very good the last day. I actually didn't think he was as good as... He was very involved in the main scores. Yeah. He, he wasn't as, as good as I thought he was because I thought Common did put a bit of a detail on him. But what I couldn't understand about Common is... To play this defensive system. That's 100%. Yeah, I know, Paddy, but if you're going to go with that system, you cannot, in my opinion, play your forward best forwards in that system. Like, you cannot play Connor Cox and Jeremy Murta and Donny Smith and Kieran Murta because them four fellas don't want to defend. It, it, it's <laughs> them guys it's, want to score. Like, yeah. they're scorers and they don't want to defend. And poor old Cox, I feel really, really sorry for him the last day because. He cost them the first goal because Cook makes the run. He tries to go with him and then it gets to the 21 and he really doesn't know what to do. Cook goes in behind him. Kelly finds him and it's over. He gives away two scoreable frees. I think I've, I've written down here, just give me one second. I think just before half time, right, just before half time, Kieran Malloy, the, the, the Kieran Malloy. Oh, ponytail. Yeah. Ponytail, I was going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> but Kieran Malloy, ponytail, right? He scores, or from Curvin. He's directly assists the three points just before halftime because Roscommon don't have the right players picked to do the system they're trying to play. Not because they're trying to, like, you can argue the pros and cons of the defensive system, mm. but if you have four out and out strikers, poachers, fellas that want to score, if you have them four fellas playing, once they get into the other half, they simply do know, not know what they're doing. Yeah. And Malloy gets the, the three assists. Kelly gets the two assists for the goals and that's the game. And that is literally the game because you have guys there that when they get into the half, it's like a back coming forward you say they've nosebleed. They have nosebleed because they don't want to be back there. So, like, in terms of a squad, like, Roscommon do have a lot of lovely footballers, a lot of lovely forwards. When you're building a squad, when you're, when you're in dressing rooms, like, have, have you seen it that a fella could be very, very good, but there's just two or three others that are are in the better in the same position. He's just not on the panel anymore. Like I was common packing themselves. Are the two top heavy? We, we played Donny Gall in 2015, right? We played Donny Gall, and I was the sixth four at the time. I was just back, playing okay, but I knew I was the sixth four. I knew I was the one that was going to be in or out. Like I knew that. You, you know that feeling, right? And we were playing Donny Gall. If we played with six out and out forwards, we were going to get beaten. And what we did was we played Barry Moore in a, in a system play because if I played that sweeper role <laughs> it'd be a disaster so we play Barry Moore <laughs> the perfect fielder to help out Neil Gallagher but then drop back when the play was he was sensational Open Crow Park was sensational we wiped Dunning all out and it, it's brilliant play right but if we play with six forwards and try to do that and I'm one of those forwards it simply doesn't work so sometimes somebody has to be sacrificed 
for the, the betterment of the team. On that day, it was me. On another day, I think Jeremy got sacrificed for the 2017 final against Dublin because we needed Tony Vaughan playing as a third midfielder. And Dublin do this all the time where you're expecting one team, but then someone gets sacrificed. I'm sure you were that sacrificial yeah. lamb, uh, Paddy, where you get sacrificed because it, you, at that time, don't fit into the system. Yeah, and, and that's, uh, I, I spoke with, with Joe the other night on it. That's the challenge for, for a coach and for Anthony Cunningham's experience and obviously Stephen Poacher is kind of getting a bit of slack because he's seen as the guy that's brought this defensive system in. I personally don't... This is the point I made about Ross Common earlier on. Ross Common are in Division 1, they get relegated, they come back up, they're a nice football. It's like, are they, are they serious about taking the next step and going and winning the kind of Championship and trying to get into the Mayo category and trying to compete for all Ireland? And I just don't see that with them. I haven't seen them in the last 10 years. They have some really good players but the role of the coach and for Anthony Cunningham and, and reading the reaction over the last couple of days, you have to make that call. That you say, okay, I have a philosophy and a style of play. And if, if you're so bought into that style of play, well, then you have to pick the personnel to, to suit that. You can't come in, and, and I'd be on, I'm a forward, so I'm a different mentality. If I was a coach, you'd go in and say, well, what players have I got at my disposal? What game plan suits them? What, are going, what is a system and a style of play that's going to get the absolute maximum out of the tools I have at my disposal? And they just fell completely between, between two stools. That the players they had on the pitch, that system is completely alien to them. And you could see it, and you could see it in every National League game they played this year. They were just, they didn't fire a shot. Didn't fire a shot. And if you're going to play, as Andy said, if you're going to play those guys up front, like get the ball into them and play on the front foot. Because you can't do the other way, because it's just not going to work, and it hasn't worked in the five games they've played this year, in all five games they've been playing. Yeah, and they, they have, they, and you, you probably know German Merton because he was in DC. Yeah. He crossed trains, but they have a sensational footballer. Like he is a sensational footballer. That's so he, he hasn't, in my view, produced what he can produce yet, but he has. The ability of, like when he came on the scene first, I thought, okay, the founder kind of Connor Mortimer, the guy who can score one nine, one ten for them in games, which is which is huge. And they haven't got that yet, but, but you're never going to get that out of him if you're taking him off. And no chance. That's going to defend out the middle of the field. They have another guy called Ulton Harney. He came on the last day. Like, this guy could be sensational, you know, but you need to get him. Joe, in, well, in where he needs to play to link the play to, to, to Murta and yet Russ Common still haven't got them two fellas on the field at the same time he's been ruined by injuries as well over the years Austin Harney he has but he need like you know the, the, that's but, he, the, but he's played about I can pick four or five different positions that Austin Harney's played over the years you know yeah. I, yeah. but if, if they keep swapping manager and keep Joe you know, and you keep having to go in and impress a new manager and you keep having to go in and Joe you know, prove your fitness and all this the same cycle is going to happen time and time again. It's time for someone out to take control of the whole situation and look after players like that. You know? so for, for a manager like Anthony Cunningham, we don't know whether he's going to stay on for another year or move on. Um, if he's staying on for another year, like for in a county like Roscommon, they, they've had a brilliant underage success over the last decade. I can't imagine they've got the biggest playing pool in terms of other counties. What are you doing there? Are you going in? Are you are you picking out different types of players to try and breed a bit more aggression or a couple of more defensive minded players? Like, what are you trying to do with your squad in the winter? They've struggled a lot. Roscommon has struggled a lot around the middle of the field for a long time. It, like, it, so you have to build a structure that's going to suit that. Now, the try that he known there the last ten, unfortunately, he got he was doing quite well and he got injured after 15, 16 minutes as he go off. So, I don't know enough about him to really comment if if he's the future, but the. They have to find a structure in the middle of the field that's going to suit who they have. And then once they have that done, then you can kind of move on to the Enda Smiths, the Donny Smiths, the Jeremy Murtas, the Connor Coxes. Because when you name out them five fellas, yeah. that, that fills quite a lot of the forward line. So they're the guys that you need to be playing well. And then what do you do in around the middle of the field to, to, to make it happen? And if the big guys were sometimes down west were obsessed with these big natural midfielders who can catch the ball, if they're not in the county, you need to find other fellas that can do that job for you. And you know, there's there's many ways to to go around that midfield structure. You don't have to go with six foot five fellas all the time, you know. Yeah. Paddy, we, we spoke about Galway in depth and we spoke about Shane Walsh in depth a couple of weeks ago. 
And there's a moment in the 63rd minute of the weekend where Walsh gets the ball on the sideline and Galway are four points up and they've been in this position a couple of times in the last 18 months or put under Porrick Joyce. And it's a wet day in the hide. And at that stage, you still didn't know whether something was common to get a, a dodgy, <laughs> scuttery goal. And, you know, things have changed. And Walsh drives for the 21. He turns back, flicks it back to Finnerty. And the Mayo man, sorry, the Galway lad puts it over the bar. What impressed you about Galway? Hopefully Shane Walsh is fit for the Connacht final. I'm not going to ask you what impressed you. I'm going to ask you, can they do damage to Mayo in the Connacht final? I think they can. I absolutely think they can. And, and, and guys like Maddie Tierney and these guys, and like you say, the, the two Kelly lads were very impressive. They got Shane Walsh and Damian Comer back on the pitch together, which is if they're going to have any sort of chance. Like, I know we might have perceived we were a bit harsh on Galway after their the kind of the implosion against Monaghan and being relegated from there. But the one thing you have to give them credit for, they started the National League in the most catastrophic fashion. They were absolutely obliterated by, by Kerry, Dillman Tralee. It was kind of, what well, what style of player are we going to have now? Are we good enough? Do we have the defenders to play man on man? Or do we need to, to, to kind of drop that philosophy and be a little bit more solid? And that's the challenge. Power of Joyce, exactly what we're talking about, probably didn't happen with with Ross Coleman, Park Joyce says, well, okay, what have I got at my disposal here? How do I make this group of players the most competitive group we can make them? And the challenge for Galway, and why I still think, even without Killian O'Connor, I still think Mayo will probably nick this. They're, they're, it's the inconsistency. They're still, you don't know what you're going to get. As solid as they were, and they were well worth their win at the weekend, you just think, Mayo have that experience and that know-how that they won't give you a lot. Whereas Galway, there's always that sense that for now, and until they prove it otherwise, that consistency is what, what Paul Rick Joyce is trying to chase. And you can get a sense after his comments after the game, he's kind of building the siege mentality that people are kind of writing us off after they got relegated and things like that. That could be a big thing for Mayo, or, or a big thing for Galway to come through. Yeah. I, I think Shane Walsh, like we said, he's an amazing, a fabulous, fabulous player. Great to see him start making those easier decisions. Sometimes the simple thing is the right thing to do. If he's missing, he, that's a big blow to them. They, they have two weeks to try and get that right. I know his history with hamstring injuries and things like that. Look, they'll do everything in their power to get him out there. Um, it was. It, it was an impressive win for them, despite it being a pretty dour game. Um, but getting all their key players on the pitch together, like I say, they're they're a lot more solid than they were in only two months ago to start at the National League. But for me, I still think, even without Killing O'Connor, I think Mayo's just experience and the nous that they have. I know, look, they've played each match of the game, but I, I think they're going to get over that pretty comfortably. I'd still have Mayo as my favourites for Connacht. Yeah, even with um, even with Killian last year, it was, it was 14 13 the Connacht final. Really, really tight game. And we've, we've kind of analysed what, what happened at the end of the game, I suppose, with the free kicks and Paul McLaughlin pulling down um, pull, yes. pulling the goal line, going into the uh, going into the square, and Shane Walsh taking the freeze, and we've analysed that. Of course, we have. Um, with the Comer Killian turnaround, that's huge. Um, Comer playing, Killian not playing. Of course, that's going to make a big difference. Um, thought Comer was okay the last day. I thought won some vital freeze, scored a nice point. Joe was just involved, and it, 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 it's it's good for yes. both players to play and wing forward. Now, the key thing for me was. Why I think we will win the Connacht Championship. We hopefully get over Leitrim at the weekend. And then it was just when you look at Paul Kelly and you look at Matty Tierney and you look at Damien Comer and these guys, Riss Common created all the Riss Common's creation. Yes, because probably they weren't playing on any forwards, but all the creation was from their backline. Joe so Connor Daly got two, Stack got a point, their assists all came from their backline. And when you have Paddy Durkin, you have Bushy McLaughlin, you have Enda Hessian, you have Owen McLaughlin, you have these guys streaming forward. With, with goal, we're playing with maybe four or five forwards, which they haven't played with in a long time. Is that channels, are them channels going to be open for Mio to sneak in behind to get goals? And I think at times, no matter how disciplined goal we are, Mio will find them spaces. And I think a goal or two either side of that will win the game. And for me, Mio will get them goals and... Um, I tell you where, where the big thing, Andy, where Killian O'Connor not being there is, is that we touched on it that Aidan O'Shea more than likely is going to have to take on the scoring burden and play closer to goal. What goal we have with Maddie Tierney coming through, I've been really, really impressed with him. 
you got Matty Tierney and Paul Conroy there. That's a very, very strong midfield. Mayo, can they afford to take Aidan O'Shea out and put him in the middle to kind of wrestle and curb the influence of Paul Conroy? Or do they have to say, look, I, I, I think Ruan is, is tailor-made for Tierney and the two of them will have a ding-dong battle in terms of athleticism. But is, is Conor Loftus going to be able to deal with Paul Conroy? Or does James Horan and the depth and the missing of Killing O'Connor, does he have to turn around and say, shit, Aidan O'Shea, we need you to score, but if, if Paul Conroy is getting on top around the middle, we need you to come out there. How does that balance work? And that's what we're talking about, where missing Killing O'Connor could, could come back to bite Mayo. And again, that's, a bit, that's a bit fascinating call how that pans out. And again, Paddy, the conditions in McHale Park, what sort of, like if it's a yeah. wet, windy sort of day. It's always wet and windy there, no matter what. Yeah, yeah. you only come down in December, don't be worried. <laughs> they, 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 uh, they, no, but I'll tell you another one, Paddy, right? We played Galway and Limerick in 2019. We were winning the game all through. It was uh, as soon as Clark, as soon as Clark, he said the penalty, we, we, the game was going to be a mere game. But Paul Cook was outstanding. Honestly, he yeah. kicked four points, kicked four points in the first half. So you're on about Tierney, Cook, Conroy, um, all good players. Uh, Tierney's an outstanding player, lads. We were involved yeah. coaching under 20 last year. We did really well on Tierney. We, like it was a wet storm of a day, right? It was February, like February 8th, a wet storm of a day. And he gets one chance. He got one chance, lads. And he buries the back. He, like, he buries it. Like, and brings it to penalties. Goal to beat, beat me on penalties. But it was, it was just showed his class. One chance on a crap day, just after winning the intermediate with his club. And he comes back and he, he, he did that. It was the vital score in the game. Was he 11? Was he 11 for the 20s? He, he, he was 11 for the 20s. And he, he, he it just, it, it was a really classy goal. Too. Yeah. Like you, you mentioned Royce Royce with Royce Royce with uh, Brian Howard earlier on. Like this guy, he's had a couple. He's only he's only a kid. He's had a couple of clutch moments though. He had that monstrous mm. mark against Monaghan. Follows it up with a massive free in the last few minutes. He got a point off that mark. Like he's an exciting footballer. Like they, there's good breeding in Galway. Like he's another fella that kick frees off the ground with both feet. They have one in Shane Walsh and they have another one now in Matthew Tierney. Like Walsh is even hand and freeze over to Tierney. Like that's a big statement to make. Yeah, I think I, I think Walsh is just on Walsh. I think he's going to be okay. If, I don't think it was one of those ones where he pulled up. With the yeah, yeah, it looked like a more of a tight hamstring than yeah. Anton. My own scientific medical view on it is that he'd be, he'd be, Break, he'd be breaking okay. news. Breaking news. Yeah, yeah. It was Andy Moore and says Shane Walsh is going to be grand. This is you me. This, this me all stirred. <laughs> yeah. Over, isn't it? yeah, 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 yeah. But I uh, don't know. No, the Galway have always produced footballers. Um, the difference in Kelly, the Kellys and Tierney, though, they're. Do you, I, I don't think any of them three boys would stand for much shit. Like, do you know, they, they, mm. I'd say they look like guys to me that would put in the work. Um, there's no kind of messing with them. Like, I don't know if you, if of course, you remember Garrett Bradshaw, how they retired there from, well, he's from the same nick of the words, woods as the Kellys, like, do you know, Hardy Boyle. Like, it's not that they're, they're coming in and they, do you know, they just think, oh, I'm a county footballer and my head is up my arse kind of thing. I, I believe them three guys will be made of the right stuff and they'll probably build a yeah. team for the next. Stand, standard setters is what you're saying. I, I think so, yeah. Okay. Um, football this weekend, we've got Cork Limerick in Limerick. Kerry Tipperary are playing that evening on Saturday evening. On Sunday, there's Leitrim Mayo and Castle Bar. Andy, I think we're both at that, are we? For off the ball at the weekend. Have you confirmed yet? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The debut. Come on. I'm on. I'm on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have. Tyrone Cavan as well at the weekend. And I want to have a word about the two Ulster quarterfinals and Derry Donegal. Which of those two games are you expecting the championship to take off in at the weekend? Tyrone Cavan or Donegal, Derry? Uh, I, I, I think we're waiting on something. We're definitely waiting on something. I, I'm more than likely you're probably going to get it from, uh, from the Ulster championship between the Monaghan and Armagh semi-final if their league game was anything to go by and, and the way Armagh kind of they've been building momentum all year and then Monaghan getting a win especially now if McManus's injury is too bad but I think these two quarter-finals look I expect I still expect Tyrone to beat Cavan and I still expect Donegal to beat Derry but we've been building up Derry they've been one of the most impressive teams in the league that they absolutely steamroll Division 3 Brilliant defensive record. They're shooting the lights out. Shane McGuigan and these guys. They're arguably, you could say, they're maybe a Division One team on the form they've showed. Can they give Donegal a right go over? Particularly, are Donegal going to risk Michael Murphy again? Or have they learned their lesson? That could be a big influence on that. So we're expecting a really, really big game there. Cavan, like, <laughs> Cavan have to have something. 
Like seriously, like yeah. they have. You, you would think being relegated, losing that game to Wicklow, that Mickey Graham and those players, as the reigning Ulster champions for the last month, have been flat to the mat and just have Tyrone in their crosshairs. I, if they've anything about them, which they do, which you know they do, surely there's a big performance from Cavan on Saturday night. Is it going to be enough to get over Tyrone? I don't, I don't think so. I expect Tyrone to win that game. Bear in mind, Tyrone's National League campaign and their kind of identity crisis that they're trying to work out. They've had time since that game at Killarney. Look, they're the two fascinating games from the weekend. And you're hoping for an upset of some sort. You're hoping for proper, proper contests. Um, I don't think you're going to get it in the, in the Munster Championship games. I don't think you're going to get it in, in, in the Connacht Championship this weekend. Sleeping so, on Limerick. We're sleeping on Limerick. I, yeah, I'm happy enough to do that. Okay. <laughs> My focus is on, is on those two games in okay. Munster. We're just hoping if for Cavan can turn something around. Because it's, you- it's been a catastrophic season for them so far. Andy, I know Tyrone are your second favourite team. We've heard you you love Tyrone. We know you love Tyrone. What I'm hearing from Paddy is that there's going to be a sting. I'm so on the rabbit hole now. I have to keep going. Yeah, <laughs> can't get out now. There's going to be a sting in the Cavan tail at the weekend. It'd be fantastic if there was. They're a savagely proud county. You'd imagine there'll be something in there. Like, they've been relegated. Well, I think there's definitely going to be a fight in them. Um, is there going to be enough or... Was there something in Division 3 where they were worked out that people could see what they were did yes, last year in terms of the, the work rate and where the press teams for their kickouts and And I think Tyrone should have enough. Now, where both Cabin and Derry have a huge chance, I think, right? So if we look at Antrim last week with Enda, Enda McGinley, very new to the scene in terms of management, and it does take a while. If you look at Wexford, Shane Roach, very new to the scene, it takes a while. Both did exceptionally well. But if you look at Derry with Rory Galler and you look at Cavan with Mickey Graham, it definitely gives them a chance. Like, like Rory Galler isn't going in there with, like, he knows Donegal inside out. Like, like if there's going to be a shock in this championship, lads, yeah, yeah. it has to be it. Like, Rory Galler knows the middle. <laughs> Your absolute leader and superstar is more than likely out. Your team is in the form of their life. Like, that they haven't got, the Derry people believe in them. And Donegal are 100% worried about this game. Like, the only team you didn't want out of the underdogs in, in Ulster is Derry. Mm. So if there's going to be a shock, this is going to be it. Do I think they have enough? I think Donegal will have too much scoring mm. power for them. I, I genuinely think, I think that's going to be the only issue. I think Derry will score plenty, but I just think Donegal will score too much. I, I genuinely think that's going to be the problem. Uh, Derry- I think, on it, you're right. The Rory Gallery influence, he knows that Donegal team. From working with Jim McGuinness, he'll have a plan for, for Ryan McHugh. He'll have a plan for Paddy McBrearty. We, we've seen Donegal have, have very kind of set patterns of play up front. Mm. It, it can at times be predictable. Now, it, it's a different thing knowing what's going to happen and being able to stop it. But Rory Gallagher's going to have plans for that. Chrissy McKay is going to be man on that full back line and he's trying to get his hands on Paddy McBrearty if Murphy's missing. And remember the, the creaks in the Donegal defence that was highlighted even by Down, who, who, who had a pretty poor season. Caleb Mooney, his speed, his athleticism. You're looking at Conor Glass coming through for Derry. They will have a really, really set game plan. They've got huge confidence on, on, on how they've performed over the spring. You're right. We're hoping for some sort of upset, something to ignite this championship. I think that the most likely place is going to be be this weekend if Cavern or Derry can get over. In saying that, I still I agree with Andy. I think the quality that Donegal and Throne have, if they bring their best stuff, should probably just have too much. But I think if you're going to see an upset, that's where it's going to be at the weekend. I can't see, I can't guess the image of and I, I think I rate this guy so highly, so I'm not talking him down in any way or form because man, Mercury's brilliant. But Chris McKay, I can't get the image of him sticking to his man in the league final against Offaly. I know they were out the gap and letting someone run in behind him. Because if you do that against Donegal and old Bone is coming through and you go with Paddy McKay, McKay or someone, yeah. that's going to be a hand pass to the back of the goal. It's going to be a tap in. So I can't get that image out of my head. And I think Rogers is slightly like that as well, where he just goes a bit too much with his man because they're so obsessed with cleaning out the, the main guys. But with Donegal, there's so much quality. You know, Donald, Langan, McHugh, Owen Bone, all these fellas running through that sometimes you have to just let McBurr to kick the ball over the bar for 21 years out. 
And that's where my big worry is. With Cavan just to go and look at Graham, Mullen Yachta, Ulster Championship, surely he is going to come with a plan. I just, he has to come with some sort of plan. And that's the only chance, and it's the only hope, and it's the only <laughs> chance that Mickey Graham has these boys set up to absolutely ambush a Tyrone and Oma next week. That's that's the only issue, only only chance that they have. Oh, well, it is, Andy, because there, there's been nothing on the pitch to suggest that we've seen. Like, Wicklow bet them deservedly and relegated them to Division 4. So th- there's been nothing on the pitch that we've seen in our four national league games to suggest they're going to bring it out. This is purely a blind faith that yeah, it is, they yeah. won the Ulster Championship last year, Mickey Graham's track record, and just the mentality of those players. Like they, they, they're, they would have been embarrassed at, at how that league came. The reign in Ulster Championship and relegated to Division 4. You have got to think that the, the pride that they have as a footballing county, the pride of the players, the pride for Mickey Graham, over the last four or five weeks, they are leaving absolutely no stone unturned in the preparation for Tyrone. Um, and that's the only thing we're basing that on. It's, it is, yeah, bright well, faith. So we'll see on Saturday night. Well, I, I don't know if there's any clues or lessons in that Ulster final last year between Cavan and Donegal, but it's, it's worth looking back on. I genuinely believe that in the 70, 78th minute of that game when Garrod McKeon had the ball in his hand, 55 yards from goal and Cavan were a point up and there were four minutes of injury time to be played. I genuinely believe Donegal still thought they were going to win that match. They were so yeah. cool and calm. They were, they were nearly, it was nearly, a, I don't know if complacent is the word, but it's like they were, they were just sure they were going to win the ball and they were going to get a point and they were going to win it. And McKeon launches it in, Pat breaks it down and Cotter Mann buries it. Like that was just like, and the day of days that was, Tipperary just one month beforehand. I don't know, like, like surely Donegal have learned their lesson. Surely they've been caught last year and they're not going to let it happen against Derry. But surely. The, the thing about Derry, right, the reason me and Paddy, and we're not being dismissive about uh, Cavan being Ulster champ- champions, the one on our mirrors, they did a great job, they prepared well and the one, the one that, but Derry have actually form where Cavan have no form. So not even looking at the Donegal thing, looking at the Derry situation, Derry went out and flaked off it. Right, Offaly go up and do a job and allow do really well. And then they go and do well against a team that are just after being promoted to Division 1. And like Derry flaked the Offaly by more than Kildare bet Offaly. Do you know what I mean? So this is real form. Like they're, as Paddy said, on that form, you could argue that they're in around Division 1 anyway. So I still think Donegal have enough because I do think Donegal will put on 22, 23 points. Where I don't think Derry will be able to put out. I think Derry will trouble them. I think the glass is a, as we said, is a gift from God from for Rory Galler, and they have a real chance. But I do think Tony Gall should have enough. You're listening to episode nine of the Football Pod. We're nearly done. Next week is going to be episode ten. So uh, <sighs> congratulations, lads! You've made it that far. <laughs> what a milestone! Yeah, we're getting there. Um, and I hope to God next week we're not starting with something off the field or a story of somebody leaving a camp. I hope we're talking about the football because I'm excited. I'm really excited. Dublin are just doing a new one. Do you know the way they all retired one a day? Yes. <laughs> what a month. Keep we're doing one every month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who's going next, you know? Giving each of the we're just keeping, this, what keeping the championship interesting, man. <laughs> There's nothing on the pitch that's keeping it interesting for the minute anyway. So, do you know what the, the big thing we're hoping for we were hoping Ross Common Galway was going to be the game. Now the conditions were bad and the way yeah. the team's kind of set up. Let's just hope that there's big games. And like I say, those two Ulster games, if we get good weather and proper, proper championship stuff, because look, the hurling was phenomenal at the weekend. They're up and running. We're waiting on the football championship to ignite. Yeah. And, and fingers crossed there's no more retirements or no one else is left. And, and we can talk about some good games uh, next week. Paddy, you poor things, you'd have no players left. <laughs> I might go back and get a game now. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we've got a couple of questions in on Instagram, lads, at footballpod underscore GA. If you ever want to send in a question, you can drop a DM or we'll put a story up every week, every week um, the day before the podcast recording and you can drop one in. Keen wants to know, why did the lads choose to wear their socks up? Andy. <laughs> I can't remember the reason I started wearing them. Um, 
but I just it it it, it was just something that I, I don't know. <laughs> Neither could I. <laughs> Actually, I'm glad you went to Andy first. I, I, I remember can't. I came back at. 15. I stopped then. I think I came back at 15 and I stopped wearing them up. I, I wore a half sock in in 15, like just a normal little red sock. And for some reason, then I just went, I said, ah, sure, if I'm finishing, I'm as well finished the way I started and pull them back up then for the, the last two or three years. But um, yeah, it was just it was just a thing I did. Um, I suppose McDonald did it when we were younger. There was probably something there. Um, you know, I thought it probably made me look a bit taller or something. I don't know, less fat. I don't know, something like that. Yeah, do you know what, maybe there was a bit of that in both of them. <laughs> With our arse hanging out of our shorts, we had to look at it a bit taller. Yeah, it took the old socks up. Yeah. Yeah. Go on, Paddy, who inspired you? No, I actually, I, thought, I can't remember why. I only did it for a couple of years, I think, and then was back. But the end, of, yeah, it seemed sense. 15, 16, you were definitely wearing them up, weren't you? 13 as well, I think, yeah. 13 as well. I was, yeah. I don't, maybe it was, yeah. You looked a little bit trimmer. <laughs> maybe that's it. I see, he's taller now. I'm only a little fella. I'm only about five foot six. Like. Adam, Adam Sheehy wants to know, we're nearly finished, lads. Uh, we'll let Andy get back to the rain and then scrone. And we'll let Paddy get back to the football. Let's see what the score is. We've been recording so long that the football is one nil. Jeez, it's one nil to Italy. Chiesa has just scored. So um, that'll tell you what time we're recording that. So Adam <laughs> Sheehy has been in touch. And Paddy, I'm going to start with you here. Is the buzz of running out to a packed croaker as special the last time as the first time? Oh, yeah, even more. Even more when you know what's coming to the end. And as a player, um, oh, yeah, it is. It's it's a very unique thing that you get to experience. And like I say, even for, for I know, double play a lot of games in Crow Park, but there's not many of them. It's a full house, but you'll, you'll never forget it. The first couple of times, maybe you do take it for granted a bit, but certainly by the end, um, 17 final, 18 final against Tyrone, even the replays against Kerry. I remember, that, I'll, I'll give an example, um, the 19, we, we were five or six points up in the replay against Kerry and we knew we'd won the five in a row. And uh, I was sitting beside Bernard Brogan on the bench and I, he was definitely gone and I was kind of, didn't know if I was gone or not. And we just said we went down to the sideline for the last minute just to kind of warm up and just jog up and down and just kind of it was a, an amazing kind of situation to be in that we have a minute or two here to actually enjoy this um, and it's that's why you do it that's why you do it yeah so for anyone who if guys are listening or, or young lads soak it up because it, it, it is a special thing and when it's gone it's gone when you're out you're out so uh, definitely when it was older and coming to the end you do, you do appreciate it even more it's a special place Andy? Just couldn't agree more. That's, there was all my main moments, I think, uh, that I'd remember come from Crow Park. Um, barred the replay against Kerry in 14 down in the Gaelic grounds, even though we lost it. It was, that was a special, special day. Um, but Croker was the, was the place he wanted to be. And for me, it was always to play against Dublin, Kerry, Tyrone, these guys were, the, the place was packed, got the privilege of playing was common there in 2017 as well, which was a special day for me and my family. But um, yeah, it was, it's just, it's an amazing spot. It's, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's and you just get used to doing certain things when you run onto the pitch. I would just kind of, I'd have to look around and see everything, just kind of, just kind of ground myself just to get myself, you know, in, into the moment kind of thing, you know. So I, I kind of look around, look where my dad used to sit. Um, so my dad used to sit in a, in a certain area, just in the wheelchair section of the, of the of the ground. Um, it's between the canal end and the Cusick stand. Just have a look up there, even though he knew I wasn't. <laughs> he, I knew he wasn't looking at me. But I, I, it was just it, I, it used to just crown me and bring me down. So special moments and yeah, as Paddy said, when it's gone, it's gone, and that's the one thing. <laughs> probably one thing you'd miss more than anything, you know. I know it was probably wasn't uh, a happy moment, but there's a gorgeous photo of you, and I think is it your your wee lassie on the pitch at the end of 2017, the All Ireland final. Um, was that is that the right year I'm talking about? Yeah, there was two 2016 and 17. There was there was one with um, like I, I'd have I'd have massive time for Bernard uh, Bernard Brogan. I'd always have studied him as a footballer, um, even though he was a lot quicker. He used to be great at running through the lines, the, the 13 and the 20 and making late runs and stuff like that. So I had a massive time for him as a, as a, as a player and a person. So there's a real, there's a lovely picture actually after the 16 with me, him and her. So um, yeah, there was a few nice moments like that in it. So um, 
yeah, they were all after losing all Ireland's now, which, yeah. But it was, they, 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 were, they were nice moments and to get the kids on the pitch. And we, and which we saw, that was, that, that, was, that was a special one as well. Paddy, I sent you on a couple of photos from after 2013, the last day. I think you had Bernard <laughs> done up in the air. You had Michael Darma calling <laughs> over your shoulder. Have you any photos from Croke Park hanging in the walls in the house? Uh, no, my mom does. My mom has one of the 13 final. That, that was my first one, obviously. I think you sent me some of those photos there. Uh, that was just kind of relief. and just a bit of, The rawest of all of them. Like the, the first was that one. your first one, Paddy? Yeah, it was because I'd obviously missed 11. And look, to be honest, that was, a, that was a tough time for me missing out on that. And you, you just didn't know if you're going to get back. And it would have been the same. For, my family would have been nearly more upset about it and trying try to hope that it, that I get back there. So the 13 one, yeah, my, my mom has one up in the house uh, at home. Um, a couple of nice ones. Actually, a couple of nice ones said to me when I retired of, after five in a row. That was a, that's when I kind of thought I was gone as well. And that was just a special thing. And, I, and I've said this on previous podcasts. That, that game, even though we didn't know it at the time, it, it felt like a culmination of something. You know, we, we assumed the longer it went on that Jim was going to stay on and stay on for, for last season. And then he eventually left the Declan Darcy the guys. And then obviously Bernard and a couple of players left. But that was just, that had been years in the making getting to that point. Um, so that was, we stayed out in the pitch for, let's say, 45 minutes to an hour after that game because it was just, we, we'd done, we'd created history, you know. So, so that, that was a special one as well. So the first one and then and the five in a row, I think, were, were probably the ones that stand out mostly. Yeah, just just when you were mentioning there earlier on about there being no wind in Crow Park apart from beyond the 21. And like, uh, we get questions in all the time about like, what's the noise like in the stadium? Like, what a privilege to play in a packed Crow Park. Like you were just saying it there, like, it's amazing, like. That's why you do it. That's, that's why you make the sacrifices. That's, you're not doing it. I hate a training. Jesus, mother of God, I hate a training. <laughs> like, but you know, you have to pay the price to, to experience those type of things, you know. And um, yeah, that's why you do it. All right. Uh, have we time for Andy Moran's moan of the week? Or are we going to leave it? Are you? I think I, I think I got it in there. I think I got it in. Okay, you did earlier on. The, the, the Sunday game with uh, Wexford. <laughs> like they're two all. Will you show their first two points? <laughs> Like they've absolutely bursted themselves for you know, the last you know, since the end of the league to get to here against Dublin. Yeah. Great win against Wicklow. You know, they score seven or eight points. Show the seven or eight points, you know, because we're not going to see these guys on the telly again until next yeah. year. So I'd love to have just seen how they went about getting them, where they put the pressure on, how they got the scores, the first five minutes of the game when it was really a battle. It shows them. Like we'll see plenty of Costello and Fenton and Howard coming for the next six weeks, you know. Like I, I just love to have seen the Wexford a bit more of the Wexford the Wexford game, you know. That's fair enough. We'll uh like we, I, I, yeah. I'm a happy person, Tommy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> You're not he's, he's tired of you with this brush now. No, no, Des Cow's never gonna speak to you again. <laughs> oh well, <laughs> <laughs> you're off the Christmas card list like you're gone I did a thing with Des there last week actually I should have thrown him I should have <laughs> thrown, him. <laughs> <laughs> thrown him under the bus here yeah, poor yeah. old Des uh, we, I don't think we can blame Des for that 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 part of yeah. the Sunday game but yeah we'll, we'll, we'll leave it at that that's Andy Moore's moment of the week this week folks so lads thanks very much for taking the time out this week again for the podcast it's been a pleasure um if you're listening in and you're not subscribed, please do. We got loads of lovely messages last week after last week's episode. Laz, I'm not sure if you got them, but a lot of people were enjoying the podcast and to let us know on Twitter and the, a couple of nice little shout outs. So if you're enjoying it, do share it. Let your friends know. Share it in your club WhatsApp groups that the lads are sending on only little nuggets from inside the Mayo and Dublin dressing rooms over the last 10, 15 years. Andy, how many years are you playing into county football? It was 20. 2003. To, no, 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 no. 2003 to 19. So I think so it was 16. Okay. 16 season, okay. So. That's it. Episode nine of the football pod. In hey, the hey, books. Hey, before you go, that's a bad hit rate. Zero from 70. <laughs> <laughs> your, execu like your execution rate is way down. <laughs> <laughs> it's way down. <laughs> Thanks, lads. Thanks, Go on, lads. Take, Take it easy.